You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hey, everybody. This is Abhinav Narayan, our moderator for the episode. Hey, Cecil. How's it going? Hey, Abhinav. How you doing? Doing good. Awesome. So today's topic is on new technology. New tech. In the themed entertainment industry. Yes. Why is this an important topic to discuss? New technology is very important, obviously, to Falcon's Creative Group, because we're always in the cutting edge, sometimes bleeding edge, (laughs) uh, when it comes to trying to introduce immersive experiences. Technology is a key component to that. Absolutely. And who's joining us in our conversation today? Today, Saham Ali is our director of technology. He's going to be joining us, obviously. That's a key role. Hey, how's it going? Uh, David Consolo also is going to be joining us, and he's kind of heading up our R&D and gaming division. Hey, guys. Um, Craig Barnett is our technical director uh, and pipeline. Uh, He's joining us. Hey, everyone. How's it going? And Jesse Allen's going to be joining us as well, and he's the director of editorial. Hey, thanks for having me here. Perfect. Well, we'll go ahead and dive into that conversation, and at the end, we'll circle back with you, Cecil, to get any final thoughts. Perfect. So the first question to start off the conversation is, what kind of technologies are you all most excited about right now? Either ones that are currently available or ones that we see you know, heading over to us from the horizon? Man, there's a lot of stuff going on, as we can tell every time we check out these conferences. Primarily for me, uh, the thing that has really changed a lot of what we do and a lot of what the industry does has been the advancements in our GPU technologies that are available, right? Video game cards um, basically are making it for us to do things that before just not even feasible on traditional CPU systems um, and the ability to scale way better than we've been able to do on CPU systems. Um, game engines have primarily you know, taken a huge uh, like advancement with these technologies. Now that game engines can basically produce quality in these graphics that are effectively as good as an offline renderer. Absolutely. It's really getting hard to discern when what is real time, what is you know offline rendered. But there's still challenges in a real time world. You have to kind of put everything together a little bit different, and that's less of a restraint of GPU technology. That's more of a we're just kind of trying to get these game engines up to speed of doing these really complex things. But again, it's real time. So, and obviously the things that come out of that would be. Like we talked about light field displays, these game engine technologies, uh, being able to do renders that traditionally would have taken us, you know, 24, 36 hours to do down to minutes or hours. Uh, it's just paving the way for more advancements and being able to turn out more higher quality visual effects and entertainment stuff. So, I, I would say for me, like the thing that's got my interest is mixed reality. Uh, and positional tracking of physical objects. Uh, And I think those two worlds will kind of come together, not in the traditional sense where you put on a headset uh, and see the world or see virtual objects in the physical environment, but eventually that will be at a point where projection mapping will do a lot of that and make it completely accessible for every kind of person to walk in, have a mixed reality experience, and it react to where they are in physical space uh, in real time. I think that's kind of the, the most yeah. exciting thing. There's a question of uh, separation for, between you and the content that kind of tends to come up when we talk about virtual reality and mixed reality. David, do you have any thoughts? I'm very interested in holographic displays. I'm, every time there's one that comes out that doesn't require me to wear glasses and I can see into a box and, and, and see the, the virtual uh, world inside of this entity, it's, it's always really cool. And there's some really cool advancements uh, done in the industry right now through lenticular displays or uh, pieces of film that flap back and forth super fast that really like make virtual objects appear stereo and in actual volumetric space. Uh, I'm always looking for that. And that's the kind of stuff that I think is underused in, in the themed entertainment industry that you can actually have everywhere as an interactive um, entertainment display uh, just for guests to interact with. It's, it's always a really cool. Yeah. Segwaying off of what Jesse said, I think it's really cool. I mean, the tracking technologies themselves being available to 
you know, the consumer. Mm -hmm. David, you were able to leverage tracking technologies that were basically a result of VR and using it in a non-VR way. You know, that's that's awesome. We, we, these type of technologies are easier now. Where you know, before to do any type of tracking, I remember a quarter million dollars for a mocap system. Oh, those are huge. Don't need that anymore. Yeah. So accessible nowadays. Yeah. These pieces, these components that were originally made for VR are now like a couple hundred dollars, and you can just use those components by themselves, uh, integrate them into projection mapping systems and mocap systems, and it's just, and they're even more efficient than the, these extremely expensive uh, mocap systems. Yeah, um, NAB. Uh, guys that make the stereo cameras uh, for like VR headsets so people can you know get their fingers and stuff in it yeah that same technology they're wanting to just stick on to cameras and use it for the film guys to do real-time green screening you know to have depth information to pull a key when there is no green screen that's just another application of that same technology that was made for a completely you know sister industry effectively right Craig yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for, with all this VR stuff that's coming out now and being able to really put you into these, you know, different unique worlds and everything and how how much computer graphics just have advanced. Everything already feels so real when you're in there. I'm just really excited for all the advancements and technology that actually lets you feel or interact physically with whatever's in there. Right. Like haptic suits yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Like, I already feel like visually I'm there, but physically I'm not. So I'm really excited to actually feel like I am the character there rather than feel like I'm controlling it. Because right now when I'm playing a VR game or something like that, I feel like that I'm not that person, that I'm just controlling You're it. You're like looking Kinda through like a Kind of like Pacific Rim style or something, sure. right? <laughs> that like I'm just mimicking whatever it's doing. But I want to actually be able to feel like... You know, if I pick up something, I want to feel it, or if something hits me, I want to feel something. Just for those of us who are not as well-versed, what is the haptic suit? Basically, it's like the popular movie Ready Player One that just came out, a suit that would let you feel via electrical signals everywhere on your body, whatever it is you're experiencing. So um, I guess a similar experience is touchscreen phones now uh, have haptics in it to let you know that you've actually pressed a button on the screen. You'll feel a little vibrate or something yeah. to know that you're actually touching this. So similar concept, but you can have different strengths of it and make it feel like you're actually holding something in your, ob in your hand that could be soft, could be hard, could be sharp. You actually feel the edges of whatever it is based on the electrical signals it's sending through, through your body. It can get that precise down onto... I mean, that's what they're working on getting to. And now, obviously, like something like you know the edge of a knife is a very, very sharp object, and I'm sure that's something they're still working on Haptics got really, really interested when we were looking at that um, the ultrasonic device um, because common, combining that tech with, let's say, holograms or whatever, I mean, literally imagine if you're looking at a hologram, you know, whether it's through a headset or it's somehow magically projected in front of us now, but you can actually touch the hologram. Yeah. And the person on the other end of that hologram can now feel you touching them in that same concept. Virtual handshake. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of where things could be headed with these type of technologies merging together. That's incredible. Yeah. I saw an omnidirectional uh, treadmill. Yeah, that exactly. Was, it wasn't even a flat surface. It was actually moving parts. And as you slowed down or stopped, like if you just immediately stopped, you would actually fall forward because the ground is still moving just still, like in real life. If you're yeah, running, you can't just yeah. immediately stop. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a lot of cool stuff on the horizon in that area. We tried an experimental uh, haptic feedback system for your hands. Uh, it was an array of transducers um, or mini mini speakers, mini mini speakers. And basically, you put your hand over, it and your the, the, the skin on your hand is so sensitive that you're able to feel the wavelength, uh, the sound the emitting from it, yeah. the ultrasonic. And basically, you're able to feel like little little micro changes, and you're able to feel shapes in it, and and that's uh, alongside with the leap motion, basically. Mm -hmm. But I'm really excited for that kind of tech too, where you're able to actually just now have a system that can replicate those senses for you. Playing on the whole like leap motion thing, how you actually control an experience is changing. I mean, we grew up in the generation of here's your joysticks and all that stuff, and and the younger generation's already dealing with like tablets and cell phones and stuff. I mean, it's leading to the point where there is not a controller. There's gestures and there's you know how you interact with objects physically. And that's super cool because now, again, you've made something that was kind of only accessible to people who have those skills, those joystick skills or whatever, and now they can go play as if it was a real world. Real quick, Jesse, what is Leap Motion? 
So Leap Motion is a basically a gesture tracking device. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. It's about half the size of a credit card, <laughs> and it sits either on the table or what they've been using it for lately is uh, tracking hand motions from a virtual reality device. So Leap Motion actually attaches to the front of the lens, and it shoots out. Uh, it's an infrared beam to just kind of get the light on the subjects and it can track both your hands. So when you open up a application to edit it, uh, you'll actually see finger data and gesture data and it recognizes several commands, you know, thumbs up, hands down, hands up, uh, hands open, you know, those kinds of things. And from that, you can use any of that data to trigger pretty much anything that you want. So in some of the experiments that I've used it with, I've had it do things like, you know, if you close your hands, then it changes the colors of an object. If you, you know, move your hand up or down, it changes the repetition rate of the animation or that you kind have of that thing. Variability. Yeah, and you can make it do whatever you want. What I find so cool about Leap Motion is uh, in, in, originally uh, you were supposed to place this object on the the table in front of you and it was facing upwards. And basically you're able to interact with a display uh, only with your hands. And then someone, I, either in, in, a, in a forum or in the actual studio itself, they decided once Oculus came out and VR headsets came out, what if we put this system on the headset itself facing outwards? And then they made, and the studio reacted, made it faster, and now it's an incredible uh, gesture system for VR. Like you can, if you try VR with the controllers, it's one thing. You try VR with leap motion hand gesture technology, like it's a whole different experience. You can pick and place objects, and your hand is is really there. Yeah, I. I... Um, in, in the past, I'd actually given a talk literally about this, and it's been about I.O., right? How we've been interfacing with computers for the last 30, 40 years. You know, it's ancient. It's keyboard mouse. Um, I remember Minority Report came out, and everyone was super excited about, uh, you know, touching gesture -based. in, in gesture-based computing. And then all of a sudden, I was like, yeah, my arm gets tired, and I'm including what I'm looking at. And it's not exactly what we were wanting, but it was a step in the right direction. I feel like the same thing is kind of happening with voice activation. Sure, yeah. You don't always want to... You talk out loud to get what you want sometimes. Sometimes you want it to be a lot easier than that. Yeah. But it sounds cool when you see it in the movies. So a lot of this technology that we're talking about has so many different applications across so many different industries. Where does it come into play when it comes to themed entertainment? Because a lot of these experiences are so uh, personal. There's a lot of scope and a lot of scale, like a haptic suit, but just for one person. How far away are we from being able to incorporate that into a themed entertainment experience? Is, is it even feasible right now? The technology's out there. It's how do we apply those technologies for the use case? Um, again, clear example, David made an amazing uh, use case of a technology that was meant for VR and used it in a non-VR application. Right? right. So it's just finding the right creative thing that we're trying to do and finding the right technology that fits that. Now, we all know, you know, VR is a little isolating and AR is kind of like the holy grail of, of, of this stuff. So if we are going to start creating these AR attractions, what other, you know, this omnidirectional uh, uh, treadmill and what other technologies do we have to kind of put together into a holistic system to create this effect? And that kind of leads us into, you know, one of the things that's kind of complicated in themed environments is a lot of times the audience is coming down a track or they're walking down a specific hallway or something and you have to do a lot of corner pinning type of techniques and that really leads us into a really cool technology that's coming out right now called light field and saham is really you know knowledgeable about yeah, this we, kind of thing but we brought up light field a little earlier let's talk a little bit about what exactly that is uh sure well you can look at it in two ways but if you're looking at light field in the realm of uh the, the way we have to capture it, it's basically being able to capture something in real life from multiple vantage points. So you're not just looking at it in a 2D or monoscopic window. You're actually looking at it from multiple camera angles. Um, an example being, uh, we all have our um, Pixel phones and Google phones, and they introduced this concept where you can take a picture and then change focus after the fact. Um, that algorithm was kind of like the light field light, right? Okay. Uh, being able to change focus after the fact. 
uh, Lytro comes out with a camera kind of ahead of its time that was a light field camera um, that allowed you to do that with a single lens. Um, they eventually realized it was really promising, move on to a bigger cinema camera, and now they're capturing, um, you know, I think it was like 96 different vantage points from one angle, uh, which then basically makes it so that you have, uh, you know, like a volumetric view of a 2D image. You can allow the person to move their head around. Now that's capturing that type of volumetric data, but the output is kind of what David's talking about is, um, you know, holographic displays, things that are moving really fast, but how do you now allow the user and multiple users be able to look at that volumetric data from any vantage point without technically knowing where they are, uh, without having to force them to wear a headset. Is there an example that currently exists or? or yeah, we, uh, I actually met with a couple guys at GDC that were displaying this, this, this box that was a holographic box that used lentecular, a lentecular array of, of, of pixels. And it basically was kind of like a eight to 10 inch uh, box and you're able to see inside of it and it has 32 different layers basically. And in real time, you can input uh, a game engine like Unity and able to feed the, the video of the game engine into this lentecular display. And as a user, you're able to see 32 planes into depth. And it was really cool. It was, it was the closest thing I've seen to a, a real time. I mean, it was real time. It was real time holographic display. It was really impressive. For the listeners out there, if you want to see this like in action, one of the, the cool things that just came out was uh, GoPro did a volumetric uh, photograph of the deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. So you're standing where the crew sits in the Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, and it's a VR experience, but it's showing this technology. So you can, it's a still photograph, but you can actually change your body and head position and look around the seats and you know get closer to the controls and stuff. So it, it feels less like a photograph, more like a physical environment. And uh, they have a, a several photographs in this display. And it, was it GoPro or Google that released this? It was, it was Google that basically bought up a company that was kind of leading the way in processing these data types and creating this light field thing. Um, yeah, the space shuttle, clear example. Amazing, right? Why wouldn't we? I mean, what's the use case? Um, the biggest issue we've seen with live action, it's still 2D imagery. Right. right, like everyone's talking about, I want to go to a sporting event. I want to be able to watch the sporting event in VR, and even in stereo, but it's flat, and I can't move my head, so it's like one vantage point. Well, this light field technology, this volumetric VR, effectively, uh, is going to allow filmmakers that are still wanting to do live action, people running around on set, and capturing that data in such a way that the user can look at this, you know, perfected shot from basically wherever they want. You know, like I want to look around the corner when we didn't plan to shoot looking around the corner. Well, I have the data for it. So now I can allow the user to do that. Well, in a themed environment, that's super cool because now you have an audience of, let's say there's, you know, 40 guests standing in a room uh, and they're able to look at this kind of data all from different vantage points. So every single person has a completely different experience yeah. based on where they're standing in the room. And you can use live actors and you can use, you know, the virtual world tied into it to make it feel even more realistic for them. So we're talking a lot about some of these technologies like a lenticular display. And are, are there any like actual use cases that the average person at home ever experiences these kind of things? Like a lenticular display, isn't that what the 3DS uses? Yes. Yes. So, like, a 3DS is a good example. Like, I mean, I recently got a 3DS, which I know I'm a little behind in the time for that. <laughs> but just, 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 like, looking at the 3D in it, it really is, like, so captivating and fascinating to look at. Just because there's, like, you know, I'm not wearing glasses. I'm just sitting there looking at the screen and seeing depth to this screen. And it's yeah. almost unreal. Because, like, in, I feel like the average person in their day-to-day -day life, you don't have experiences like that. Like, you know, the, the 3D most people know are going to be, like, what you have at the movie theaters, which you are putting on glasses for. Now the and crazy difference between the DS and displays nowadays is that the DS is one single user because it actually tracks your face and it, uh, it's like a wiper and it actually moves in the direction of your specific face. So another user wouldn't be able to uh, experience what you're experiencing. But in a themed entertainment dis um, system, you need multiple users to experience it as easy as possible. And nowadays these holographic displays are allowing multiple users to be able to experience that all together. 
That's pretty cool. Is that just because the the way the display is layered is that it can be viewed from basically in direction? There is no facial tracking yep. needed anymore. It's basically like how they used to do in the old animation systems like Walt Disney. Basically, they would layer just film after film after film to get the parallaxing effect. But instead of being film, it's actually uh, pixels uh, transparently layered across uh, a, a number amount of layers spaced a little bit as well. Uh, and in this case, there's a couple that are 32. There's there's so many different. So it's only probably going to get better yeah. where the resolution of these slices effectively, that's yeah. your volumetric, yeah. you know. Now, the, the, the limitation is you only have that much space. You can't make it go... You can make it go closer and further, but you can't make it go that far away because there's only so much space mm -hmm. in there. So there's still limitations to that to that system, but it's 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 getting there. It's pretty cool. And I guess that's where AR kind of comes in to help push that farther than where yeah, then you can go any depth. AR also uses uh, and there's new headsets now that are using light field technology as well. And basically, so whenever you have a system like a very simple AR headset, you're showing a single plane of, of light uh, per eye. And so let's say you were to close one eye as you're looking through this AR headset, you would look at an object that's really close and really far, phys uh, virtually, you wouldn't be able to see the difference because there's no depth of field. It does, there's no parallax. You only get the sense of parallax when you have two eyes looking at these uh, images. However, with light field display, if you were to close one eye, look at one virtual object, the, the object that's further away is blurry because it's actually replicating what r real light, it's actually light uh, entering your eye and, and it, it ensures depth of field. So it just looks even, even better. A lot of the technology that we're discussing today revolves around sight, visual effects, the, you know, crispness, 4K, all of that. Uh, we talked a little bit about some tactile elements with like the haptic suit and uh, the, the controller vibration. Have there been other advancements in technology designed for other senses that we haven't talked about? Uh, audio, scent, taste, I guess? smell o vision Yeah, <laughs> smell o vision so, I went to GDC and I found a booth that displayed this tech where it was an attachment for a VR headset where you could actually uh, smell uh, scents. And it had uh, a set of five smells that you had to refill. But it looked pretty cool and it was it, that's in just the next level of immersion. We used to have... I mean, we've, we still do. We have 4D dark rides and theater rides that have smell integrated and lights, and it's just that extra sensory um, addition. That, that kind of component is always so impactful when it comes to immersion. Has the actual uh, execution of it or uh, delivery of it evolved over time? I, I don't exactly know if it's even something that needs to be improved. Until we can actually create atoms or m change the <laughs> atoms sure. out of thin air and change its composure and make it something that we can smell that it generates in real time, unfortunately, there's only so much we can there's, do. There's only so many yeah. ways you can we improve the smell. We gotta find five ingredients that I if you mix them any way, you yeah. can make the smell of a dirty diaper to a banana. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Some other cool uh, tech that I've seen is the ability to have haptic feedback in your hands as you grip objects. So there's simplified controllers that actually is just a trigger finger. So you hold the, the basic controller, VR controller, as you would, but the trigger finger actually has force feedback. So as you pull it, it'll pull your finger backwards in the same amount. So let's say you want to pick up a, a sphere in the world. As you push down on it, it will actually act in the opposite direction to, have a, 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 uh, to stop your finger from moving, or it could be squishy, right? And yeah. they're doing the same thing with gloves, too, and they're haptic gloves, but they're more uh, physical gloves. So it, it, when you want to hold a squishy duck, Right, it will actually squish, and there'll be motors that pull on your on give your you fingers resistance. and give you resistance. And as Craig was saying, the eventual goal is to get the pinpoint prick of a knife uh, level of precision. Yeah, to actually be able to feel you know everything you can, actual texture of things. I mean, that's one thing that I'm really interested to see the development of. Is it's one thing to be able to say, yeah, this is a sphere, this is a cube. But it's another thing to be able to say, yeah, this is bark, this is sandpaper, That's this wet. is, a, yeah, this is wet, yeah. this is slippery, <laughs> those kinds of feelings. Hopefully one day we'll be able to connect directly to our brains and stimulate the senses that way. Right, and that's how we could do smell too, right? Where you're saying, how do we actually create items out of thin air? Well, maybe you don't need to if you can trick the brain into doing it. Yeah. But smell is one of those things, though, that like, how much do you really want to smell? <laughs> yeah. Right, though? Like, that's one thing for me that isn't really, like, I don't enjoy that level of immersion for some reason. 
Like, A Bug's Life. That's a good point. Um, the stink bug in A Bug's Life at Disney really bothers me. Like, I actually don't like the ride because that Spaceship Earth, they have the burning, the burning, smell. The burning smell, and, like, I'm, I'm allergic to smoke. Okay. And every time I ride that ride and smell that smoke, it, I don't know if it's just psychological, but I actually feel like my asthma my allergies kick in when I know there's no <laughs> smoke there. That's, that's a really interesting point because we allow our senses to be engaged with so many of the craziest things, if you think about it. Loud jump scare noises, incredibly disgusting visuals. But it's interesting to think about maybe there's one or two senses that crosses like a line for people. So that's not something I had never considered before, but that's very true. Especially if you go realism, like if you had a zombie yeah, if you game go real, with yeah. actual rotting zombies. Yeah, if you no if you one smell would enjoy that. Playing yeah. that. <laughs> that might be a bit much. Yeah. Uh, of course, one of the things being a, a guy who came from audio engineering as a background, uh, three positional audio is incredible. Um, you know, we have kind of grown up in the era of like cinema sound, where you have seven one or five one, where you're kind of you know basically uh, swirling sound around in a circle, right? It's it's all in this kind of like linear format. Now you're starting to see things like Dolby Atmos where it's positional based audio. So you can have multiple speakers. We're talking like 10 or greater speakers above you, behind you, uh, upper and lower because your human ear is so good at kind of figuring out where sound is actually coming from. You can notice the difference of like, if you know uh, you see a character on screen on the right side of the screen talking, but it's coming out the center channel, your ear goes, yeah, it's coming out that speaker in the center. You can notice that. Well. Where, you know, now some of the 3D positional stuff is like, it'll, you know, kind of move that by emitters to say it's, you know, 5% in the middle. It's, you know, 10% over on the right. It's, you know, another 20% above or whatever. And now your ear is starting to believe that, yeah, that sound is actually coming from that position in, in space. The interactive guys and I, we play games where we need to hear footsteps and we need to hear where things coming from or, or shots That's are heard. True. So it's really great. And it's a whole different ex feeling of playing a game in VR because you're able to turn your head and as you can hear the tail of the, the gunshot or whatever it, a footstep, as you hear the tail of it, you're able to direct yourself exactly how you would in real life. And it's super informational. And on that note, you're playing in headphones and you're able to turn your head and not have the whole world like sound, you know, uh, basically follow it. But you're you're tracking as if it was in a physical space. So if you hear something behind you, you turn your head. Uh, it's now on the appropriate side, not like your headphones are just, you know, reorienting the world. Tools for this has been really interesting to watch the last few years. I know real time, it's basically free, right? It's yeah. it's being done. But for the guys in the film, if you're shooting live action or, you know, we're composing a shot, you don't necessarily always get the audio exactly where it needs to be. And these tools that are coming, I think I saw something from Adobe where you can feed it all the audio channels, yeah. and then the video footage is of 360, it analyzes it, and then basically creates a Doppler map of your footage of where the audio is coming from if you were in VR. Yeah. And then you can literally just pan the audio in software and put it to where the source is supposed to be, and it fixes it. Like, these tools didn't exist two years ago. These, this is happening now, so it's, it's really, really interesting. We're also start starting to see just the process of mixing the, uh, an audio yeah. experience uh, step away from the traditional mixing console or the mouse. I mean, we're, we're seeing examples of literally you can be standing in a dome theater mixing with a set of virtual reality controllers yeah. saying, yeah, the sound comes over here or this one's going to turn around and circle the audience this way. Um, and, you know, certainly with gesture based uh, controls, you could start to get into some really subtle, finite audio mixes and that's just a completely different way of approaching a project so you know you're you're getting into systems like that you're getting into stuff where, uh, you know we're already seeing examples with adobe where they're doing procedural voice generation yeah. so you can feed it several different lines and create a word from literally nothing or you know just analyzing other data and that kind of opens up a huge door of variables when you start talking about interactives in a themed environment. You know, uh, currently you get on a ride, you hear one narrative for your story. It would be cool that, uh, you know, if especially if the guests are wearing any type of headphones, that the narrative can be tailored toward their specific experience. And mm. that's, it's already active in a lot of modern video games where you're hearing dynamic speech being played out in real time. Uh, we just haven't crossed that line over into the theme park world where that story can change depending on the decisions that the guest makes. Yeah. Speech synthesis with AI 
real time, like where it's headed, where, I mean, you all remember when we used to be able to type in our notepad and have the computer read it off as this monotone AT&T voice. Yeah. And now you can literally make up words that were never said with analyzing these audio tracks. It's, it's pretty crazy. And then, you know, if I have a sample audio in a real time game engine, I feed it, you know, 10 hours worth of audio from a, a, a voice actor. And now we can create any possible dialogue in real time. Yeah. Sure. No problem. <laughs> I mean, with AI getting more advanced and now, you know, people teaching these machines how to recognize different images and stuff like that, I wonder when the next level will be where we can recognize objects now. Well, now, as we watch a video and we recognize these objects, let's associate sound with these objects we're seeing in these videos. Well, then is there a point in time where we can get where you just give this software a video and it can create sound for the video you're watching based on, yes, I see that as a gun shooting. I know what a gun sounds like. And that gun is right there, so I can make that sound come from right there. And an audio model of this is what it's going to sound like right? in this room because this is where the, you don't even have to. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't have to do sound effects and mix. Where the AI can learn from. You know, you give it every movie that's existed so far, and it can learn from all those objects and sounds. And I'm sure in the future it'll be something that we're looking at. Just like uh, actually, I just saw something very recently that someone had gotten the drawings from the Flintstones. Yes. <laughs> and they have created an AI now that can procedurally generate episodes of the Flintstones. And it will just piece together pieces of what they've done and create new stories that have never been told before. Sometimes it actually does well enough where you came and tell that it's not an actual clip from the Flintstones. Other times you'll see really weird things where it'll be like Fred's body on somebody else's yeah. head or something. And it's tried to like piece it together because it thought that's how it was supposed to go when it wasn't. But it's one of those things like we're already getting that way for creating video content. Algorithms as a director. Yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic technology. I, I think that about wraps up the conversation. Thanks, guys. No yeah, problem. Thank Welcome. you. Thanks for having us. We want to thank our panelists again for joining us on this conversation. Cecil, any final thoughts? Wow, that was a wonderful conversation. Uh, it's intriguing to hear such dynamic dialogue. And to be candid, it's refreshing to think I had preconceived ideas of what was going to be discussed. Oh, yeah. And it's nice to see, you know, new ideas that got percolated up in a conversation that I hadn't even, you know, really thought about. Haptics is an interesting thing. Definitely. You know, the physical aspect of feeling things. You know, when we do mass experiences, you start to eliminate things, you know, opportunities because of the difficulties of having every guest experience it equally. And haptics was never in my mind, you know, to, to introduce. But in reality, that's starting to come into play. I was really excited about getting the conversation into t new technology that's not just about evolving the visual side of things, but about the full sensory spectrum of what you can experience. All the different senses. One really interesting point that I wanted to get your thoughts on was the idea that there may be some senses of immersion that may go too far. There was a point in the conversation yeah, where we right. were talking about smell exactly. and even taste. Like, you may not want to be that fully immersed if the story involves zombies or, you know, <laughs> so, something that, you know, could be actually... Burnt flesh, off yeah. Yeah, offensive <laughs> in some way. That, and that, that was a really interesting storytelling challenge that I had never really considered. You know, we, we designed the Hard Rock Vault and we introduced scent in the CBGB's room. And urine was one of the oh really yeah <laughs> fermented beer and urine and cannabis <laughs> was part of the effort. It's authentic. Yeah, so you know I thought it was over the top, but in reality it brought you know people's memories back to what it was like to be in these clubs. So in reality it there might work. not be a limit because sometimes you push the envelope to create and evoke an emotion. Yeah, you know it may not want to be an hour long of, course. <laughs> of an experience, but snippets of these extreme moments, um, even that might be okay, depending on duration. So interesting dialogue. I guess it really comes down to the type of audience and n making sure that we you really understand them. And I think the director, you know, the, the composition and c how you compose these assets in telling a story and how f frequent and how little you know, and how, how large you make it is part of the effort as well. So, all good tools. Absolutely. Well, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. This is great. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, 
and Instagram.